Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to do a video now on John Michael Greer and the ecological hermeneutics of deep memes. This is a talk which I was invited to give at an academic conference at college in Tamil Nadu here in Southern India day after tomorrow, but I decided to first share it with you here over YouTube because it deals with a lot of the same problems we've been discussing on this channel for the past four years, as if we're a part of the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can also become a part of the School of Forbidden Texts for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So at first glance, it might seem a little bit strange to be talking about ecology, hermeneutics, and um, deep memes, whatever that means, in the same video. But if you really think about it, um, especially from Greer's perspective, I believe, um, they're all really trying to do the same thing, which is they're all trying to understand the relation between parts and wholes. Greer has gone as far as to claim that ecology is something like a universal skeleton key to allow you to understand other seemingly unrelated disciplines, even to the point that in one early Archdrude report post, um, in which a, a reader asked um, uh, what texts he would recommend for one to be able to understand his work better, um, the list included things like, say, Spengler's Decline of the West, that's important to understand Greer, um, The Limits to Growth is another massively important text, but um, at the very beginning of the list, he put just any ecology textbook, and that is because understanding how parts and wholes function within, say, nature, allows you to understand things that do not seem to be intrinsically ecological, like, say, history. Uh, once again, history is just ecology mapped over the dimension of time. Even spiritual problems, as a practicing occultist, um, he understood to have ecological, or rather ecology allows you to understand spiritual problems. Okay. So um, his example in his uh, 2001 book, Monsters, of the nightmare of the so-called old hag, you had this problem with uh, the Hmong refugees who had been displaced from Southeast Asia due to warfare um, and relocated hastily to the United States, um, they started having nightmares in which they would be um, uh, harassed by a malicious spirit in their sleep. Okay, and sometimes it was so bad that it literally led to death. Okay, they literally, their hearts stopped while they were sleeping. Okay, and this was something which, if you scratch the surface, you'll find that the um, rituals of ancestral honoring, etc., that they had been able to perform in their home in Southeast Asia, um, they were no longer able to do after they'd been relocated because the the physical infrastructure to perform the ritual was not there. It was only when they restored, they rebuilt that, okay, in their new home and resumed performing the ritual that this stopped. And he says this is an ecological problem because there's an ecosystem of spirits and that had been disrupted by the war, but there was a way to correct or to, um, to mend that damage and that was something you could only really understand if you think about it in ecological terms. This is exactly what the people who were trying to help the Hmong did not consider. For them, it was strictly oh, a purely neurological hallucination with, with no basis beyond some misfiring of the brain is how they hastily dismissed it. So, the irony is, even those who are trying to approach it um, scientifically still don't think ecologically, because ecology really is, once again, the study of how parts and wholes function. Well, what does that have to do with hermeneutics. Well, hermeneutics is really actually trying to do the same thing, but first we have to understand what hermeneutics was and where it came from. Well, hermeneutics was traditionally the study of the interpretation, not just of all texts, as you might assume, um, but specifically of texts within, say, the Classics and New Testament Studies departments. And it's important to keep in mind that traditionally, Classics it did not refer even to things we would take for granted today as being included in there, like Shakespeare. The canon traditionally ended with Dante in the Middle Ages and only later was expanded to include things as ridiculously inappropriate as like Bless Me Ultima by Rodolfo Anaya, entertaining book but really not a classic. The classics traditionally were um, things uh, written basically in ancient Greek and Latin, um, and therefore were texts which had an intrinsic difficulty, not only in terms of understanding their subject matter, but um, even in terms of um, there was a linguistic barrier between you and the text, which you had to expand a lot of effort to overcome because you, it was not enough to read Homer in uh, English translation, as you know, wonderful as that is. You had to actually learn ancient Greek as a language which um, is maybe even something that a modern Greek speaker has to systematically learn. There was a woman from Athens um, who I knew years ago who told me when I was first learning Greek that, um, you know, you have to systematically learn the, the Greek to read Homer. Now, you can um, 
use your knowledge of modern Greek to say read uh, the New Testament because that's a more recent form. So um, even a, a native speaker of Greek has to systematically learn because there's a linguistic barrier. But even after you overcome that barrier, there's still many others. And you find that um, interpreting the text is something of a process of repeatedly overcoming these hurdles. And this repetition um, led to the model of the hermeneutical circle in which it was eventually understood that there's a certain paradox inherent in the process of interpretation in which you would naively think that you can only um, have an understanding of the whole um, if you have inductively built it up from assembling all of the smaller parts and pieces of it into this bigger composite image, okay? But the paradox of textual interpretation is that it's, I, I dare to say it's almost the other way around. You can only even begin to understand the smallest part of the text if you already have some understanding, however implicit, of what the whole looks like. And of course, this is a circular process because as you gain more information from examining the particular parts, you gain a better understanding of what the whole looks like through literally changing the image of it in your mind, okay? And the fun of uh, murder mystery novels is precisely um, the guessing game of seeing whether your projection of the whole of the story is correct. Did you correctly um, single out the murderer, or did you fall for one of the tricks laid within the book that they wanted you to think it was someone else and you fell for it? Or were you successful in um, taking all of the particular clues which had been planted within the story? Were you successful in, um, you know, uh, arriving at the right uh, uh, solution to this problem? Well, it's not only murder mystery novels which use this sort of hermeneutical circle. It's rather the interpretation of not only all texts, but perhaps even of things that don't seem to be... Um, matters of hermeneutical interpretation, like, say, your understanding of maybe your own life, or even the life of the entire civilization which you inhabit. Greer makes the argument that we fail to understand where our civilization is headed precisely because we have the wrong understanding of the whole in a properly hermeneutical sense, because, as we'll find later, we have the wrong story in mind. But how can we possibly hope to get the right story except through falling back on another understanding of how parts and wholes function, which is ecology? This is important, by the way, even um, in things which seem to be not the realm of narratology, like, say, your own life, because the context which you inhabit is always an ecological context, and therefore you can only really understand where you are if you understand how you as a part are, are functioning in relation to that whole. This is, of course, complicated by the fact that the moment of history we're living in right now is one in which a part of the whole we inhabit is the historical anomaly of fossil fuels, which has created a historically anomalous expectation that the short-term growth which those fossil fuels enabled will simply go on forever because the cause of that growth was not the fossil fuels as a part of that whole. It was rather just human ingenuity and innovation and brilliance. It was a, the scientific method. It was just because we were more ethical than preceding generations. Uh, you know, the uh, traditional American patriotic response was, well, we succeeded because we had freedom and democracy. The modern um, SJW response is, no, we succeeded because we're not bigots in whatever sense we accuse of the other people of being. But really, it's none of those things. The analysis of parts and wholes shows you it's the anomaly of a certain part of that whole being fossil fuels, but of course the use of them is also causing those to disappear. And when those are no longer a part, if you apply the expectations of the ecological context when they were present to a situation where they are absent, you will not have the right image of your mind of the whole projected over time, and it will lead to disaster. And therefore, if we're talking about restoring an image in our mind of the whole, the word which Greer uses for that, at least in his 2012 book, Apocalypse Not, um, is a meme. Now, he doesn't call it a deep meme in the way that I did. That's kind of my own term after reading his text. But we could use that now because he mentions in um, other contexts that um, 
This is something which is uh, kind of below the surface in multiple senses of the word, as we'll find here. Um, but basically, the idea here is that just as the hermeneutical, uh, the hermeneutical circle unfolds over time, because it is trying to project expectations for what is going to happen on the basis of evidence gathered from the past in relation to what is being examined at the present moment, a deep meme kind of does the same thing by restoring an image of the whole as projected over the time of a its whole lifespan. And if you have that image restored, you will have a better understanding of things like, say, apocalypse predictions or speculative bubbles or plans for utopian lifeboat communities. Um, you'll have a better understanding of them um, precisely by not focusing on surface level details, which will only distract you from that, as we'll get back to a little later. You can also do this, though, with things like religions and civilizations. And it's interesting that the religion he applies this to is not one of the traditional um, monotheistic or even um, one of the traditional theistic religions at all, but rather the godless secular religion of progress, as he calls it in his 2015 book, um, After Progress. Um, and also the industrial civilization, which we take for granted as the only way um, anyone could ever exist, but which is fatally dependent on the ecological presence of fossil fuels. So if you're talking about fossil fuels running out, you're really talking about peak oil. But the interesting thing about peak oil is that insofar as peak oil is a myth, <laughs> or insofar as there is a myth about peak oil, it's precisely the myth that it's just a technical problem. Greer mentioned in a 2008 interview that um, the technical parts of it as a problem um, are not something that we need to invest a lot of uh, time and energy into uh, solving right now because it's already been solved perhaps dozens of times very long ago in the past uh, the technical part of, of it as a problem was already fully solved decades ago in the sense that um, people have uh, drafted up credible um, transition plans for how exactly we could go from a petroleum-based society to some other post-petroleum society the problem is that not a single one of these rational plans has ever actually been put into action, at least not on a scale large enough to be meaningful. And that's because the one thing that was missing was not reason. Okay, <laughs> Reason alone um, had already pretty well worked out what some theoretical plan could be. The thing that was lacking was just willpower. But if you're talking about willpower and motivation, you really are, in one way or another, talking about narrative, okay? You're talking about mythology, and therefore the problem with people is the problem of the kinds of stories that we tell, and more importantly, the kind of stories which we really believe. The religion of progress has trained us to believe that the only future which could realistically um, be projected um, is one of limitless technological progression, eventually leading us to uh, zoom off into the stars, okay? However unrealistic that fantasy might be, is still the only one we can believe in, not because reason has led us to conclude that it's possible, but rather because the story of star exploration has hijacked our deepest emotional drives. Therefore, the conflict between peak oil as basically the shape of the bell curve that I have pictured on the screen and progress as this shape of the ascending arrow is really a conflict of two different deep memes. On the one hand, a shape in which you reach a certain peak and everything after that is decline, and another shape in which there is no peak and there is no decline because everything keeps getting better. In order to understand how we could believe in something, despite not really having any evidence from, say, purely empirical means to back it up, we have to consider um, how John Michael Greer understands the architecture of the human subject um, roughly to look like. And this we have to talk about the um, distinction between figuration and abstraction, which he um, speaks of in detail in his 2015 book After Progress, which I highly recommend, but also um, brought up um, uh, in, say, early January uh, Ecosophia post of this year. And basically for him, the idea of figuration is that what your five senses take in are a bunch of colors, smells, tastes, sounds, and tactile sensations, but um, that's not really how you experience the world because um, you have certain patterns which you use to unify them into um, various 
coherent and self-identical objects. You think that this is something which is just um, done by the objects themselves out there in the external world, but it is always really being done by you. If you um, use the example uh, that he did uh, a few weeks ago of um, a very, very young child, okay, who um, has sensations of, well, there's some white color here, and, uh, you know, there's a sort of plasticky sensation uh, to, uh, to the touch, and, you know, kind of a, a milky smell, it's um, unified into what it later recognizes um, with language to be a bottle of milk, but at this point it's simply unifying all of those sensations into an object which it knows familiarly is the thing that feeds it, okay? Um, this is something which even in adulthood, you still do, um, have to do with this sort of figuration, but you don't notice it unless you're put into a context in which the sheer unfamiliarity of of where you are um, forces you to notice this as some as happening a little slower than usual. He gives the example of um, waking up in an unfamiliar room um, with poor lighting, and it really takes you a moment to figurate the things around you into distinct pieces of furniture. If you've ever woken up, like, uh, I remember um, being uh, flying back from India to the United States once I had to stay overnight in England, okay? And I remember waking up um, with, you know, pretty bad jet lag um, uh, in uh, this place where I didn't even know what country I was in. It took me a moment to realize, oh yes, I'm in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and um, this must be some hotel room. Slowly, just a little bit slower, those sensations get figurated into pieces of furniture, and you come to remember where exactly you are. And this shows that this figuration only perhaps seems to be automatic, instant, and it seems to be done out there by the objects themselves, but it's always really being done by you. The problem is, what happens when this knowledge which you bring, almost on a hermeneutical level, to your surroundings is not limited simply to the figuration of those sensations into objects, but comes to add another layer of abstraction through language. He gave the example in the Ecosophia post of the very, very young child who is familiar with this, you know, basically collection of colors, smells, tastes, etc., which, you know, it feeds it. Um, and then later on, after entering into language, acquires a linguistic label to say, oh, that thing is a bottle of milk. And the abstraction, which language gives it through this label, is, in a certain sense, associated with that figuration, but it does a lot more than simply um, uh, provide um, a name for something which is better understood on a directly empirical level. Rather, language creates its own feedback loop, which allows one to paradoxically understand in advance what the bottle is better through having a higher order symbolic knowledge of it which is not simply redundant of all of its sense content properties. The interesting thing about entering into language is the kind of knowledge which it supplies regarding these objects does not simply reiterate the collection of colors and tastes and other directly uh, sensible properties which it has. Rather, abstraction allows you to have a knowledge in which you feel you understand it better precisely if you have <laughs> the abstraction than if you were just left with the bundle of sensations. The problem is that spending too much time manipulating those abstractions in your mind within the realm of language um, is that it can sometimes lead you to fall into what I call linguistification, but which Greer calls in his early um, Archer report posts um, something like reification. Reification is the thought error of mistaking one of these abstractions for the kind of object which must exist in the same way that physical objects do. And he gave the humorous example last year after the collapse of Afghanistan um, of the uh, Potemkin villages which uh, had to be constructed in conquered areas of newly conquered areas for the Russian uh, Empire um, some centuries ago in order to um, uh, confirm that the news they had been given, that the uh, conquest was successful and, you know, these villages had been established where everything was peaceful and everybody was happy to have been conquered, um, they told this to the Empress um, with language and a level of abstraction. When she actually showed up to inspect the place, they realized they had to provide some sort of object to 
um, back up with evidence what had taken on the status of a perverse object through reification. You also have the strange case of abstractions which are never experienced, not even at the level of these artificially constructed Potemkin objects, but they're still believed in, and in fact they're believed in even more than anything which actually corresponds to the ideal of a physical object which is figurated from things that your five senses actually take in. And um, a great example of this is once again the Apocalypse meme. It's interesting that um, every single Apocalypse prediction ever made has failed. But every generation still finds another future event to pin their predictions of Apocalypse on. Greer noted in his 2012 study of the history of apocalypses that um, if you put all of these um, um, predictions side by side, okay, you can perform a morphological analysis which reveals certain deep structures in much the same way that a biologist could um, unearth a uh, you know, deep structural um, commonalities when analyzing the body parts of animals that had a common evolutionary ancestor not too far back. That's kind of where we get morphology. Oswald Spangler, of course, also did this with civilizations, as noted earlier. Well, Greer himself did this with apocalypse predictions and the deep structure on a morphological level which he unearthed despite surface level details differing admittedly in each case is something which allowed him to see that whether one was talking about the original apocalypse prediction of Zarathustra, which was basically a battle between the god of good and the god of evil, which would lead to a new world in which evils like death itself had disappeared, because those were the fault of the god of evil who had been defeated in this apocalyptic battle. Okay, Or you have um, the uh, Jewish predictions of the Messiah over the millennia, Okay, um, of many different kinds, with many people even claiming to be the Messiah. Messiah, as he noted in this book. Um, then you have, of course, the modern, largely American Protestant evangelical idea of the rapture, okay? The idea that um, when the apocalypse really arrives, those who are faithful won't really have to suffer from it because they'll be um, basically taken away from here, okay? And there will be a, a, a trial period for people who realize now that they should repent to do so, okay? This is, um, it, at the surface level, perhaps very different from Zarathustra or the, the Jewish Messiah, um, but those are surface levels with, which differ. But the deeper structure, we can see some commonalities. Then you have the purely secular version. Far from being limited only to traditional religions, you have Ray Kurzweil's singularity, in which at some point computers become smart enough to create other computers which are smarter enough than they and certainly smarter enough than we are to solve things like death and at that point you get to um, leave this fallen body and be uh, you know uh, transported to the stars in a robotic body where you can basically do anything you want and um, this is you know once again surface levels deep uh, surface level details are different Deep structure, we see a lot of commonalities. Then you have 2012, which is um, based on a misinterpretation of one line of text in the Mayan um, inscriptions of hieroglyphs, which was misinterpreted to, as uh, a prediction of the end of the world, despite the fact that the Mayans themselves have countless other inscriptions referring to dates long after 2012. Um, then you have the UFO phenomenon um, and nuclear apocalypse filling the same role in less... Um, uh, religious and more technological and modern terminology, but in all the cases, Greer noted that you don't really have to examine the surface level details too much. In fact, that's what the people who fall for the apocalypse meme do, okay? If you know the underlying image, and especially the image of the whole meme, and that really means projected over a span of time, um, you'll know more about this than the people who spend all of their time obsessing over it. Um, because a restored image of the whole shows you what the final outcome of it will be. The outcome of every apocalypse prediction is that the event it predicts fails to arrive, okay? And you've seen this with all these. 2012 is a great example. The world did not end in December 2012. And um, I seem to remember that day being filled with nothing but people joking about that if they even remembered that that was the day the world was supposed to end at all. Okay, so the... Um, the whole image simply shows you that the essence of Apocalypse is that it's an event that doesn't happen. Um, and you can um, use this sort of morphologi morphological analysis to get the 
full image of many other things which people reliably fall for over and over again, for example, speculative bubbles. John Michael Greer mentioned that um, when he was living in um, Seattle in the late 1990s, which was one of the centers of the computer industry, he had uh, friends who were working in the computer industry who told him that he was um, a fool not to invest in the dot-com bubble. Um, and if he uh, told them that uh, it, it was it's something that could be compared on a morphological level to the Great Crash of 1929 or the stock market crash of 1987, they would simply dismiss him as not investing simply because he uh, didn't know anything about computers. Now, obs obsessing over the surface level details, this bubble's different because it's about computers. Just like um, this apocalypse prediction is different because it's about also about computers with Ray Kurzweil singularity. Well, um, that bubble popped too. And then um, just a few years later, um, other friends told him he was a fool not to get into the housing bubble, which would never pop, um, as some books literally claimed in their title. Um, but he, he told them about the other bubbles that had popped, including the one just a few years earlier, and they said, no, no, you're not getting into it simply because you don't know anything about housing. Okay. Uh, once again, they're obsessing over surface-level details, but of course that one popped just as well. You could hear probably the same voices today, um, especially during the extended lockdowns. There was about five companies that were still doing pretty well because all of their services were offered online and the world governments had basically forced people to spend all of their time on their smartphone, not able to leave their house. So you could imagine somebody saying, oh, you're just not investing in this um, online service because you don't know anything about online services. Well, we'll see what happens. The essence of every bubble is that it pops, okay? And this is something which can only be restored if you shut out those surface level details. I don't care that it's about computers or housing. I know the essence of the deeper meme. Similarly, every utopia collapses very quickly. The unspoken presupposition of the apocalypse is that there's going to be mass destruction, but it's going to affect everybody except this small lifeboat um, community, which of course the person obsessed with the apocalypse happens to belong to. And the other side of it is that once everybody else has gotten rid of and all of the oppressive institutions of this world and here and now are gone, this lifeboat community will be freed up to finally have the perfect society. Well, the problem is that the utopia is something which can also be understood better if you shut out the surface level details. That might be a utopia based on politics. You have um, a utopia where only leftistist of all leftists um, are allowed, okay, and I've seen these myself, okay, it's, it's a political consideration where, well, if there's an apocalypse, we only want people with uh, the, um, the most progressive values to survive a certain ideological ethnic cleansing, okay, it can be based on politics, it can be based on religion, it can be based on any one surface level detail, but the underlying structure of the utopia is that even if you throw something together for a few weeks, it inevitably collapses over time because the kinds of problems in the outer world it was fleeing from were not resolved in that process, okay? And therefore, you don't need to know the surface level details of utopia to know that's not going to work, okay? So why are these abstractions believed in if, insofar as you have empirical evidence given to the senses, it only refutes it, okay? This is something which I think we can only understand if we see, as uh, Greer told me himself just a few weeks ago when I asked him about this um, in the course of, um, you know, uh, basically uh, posing some questions for uh, the upcoming book that I've proposed to write, The Philosophy of John Michael Greer. Um, his response was that these kinds of abstractions are always part of a narrative, okay? And if you really think about it, insofar as you have a complete time image associated with that abstraction, um, that complete time image is uh, fit into a narrative, okay? And insofar as you have this movement through the hermeneutical circle, which allows you to try to fill in the gaps of what that whole looks like, you can have this cognitive dissonance sustained in which you don't have any evidence to back up that the apocalypse is going to actually happen, that the lifeboat community is going to function, that the speculative bubble will not pop. You don't have that because your imagination can fill in the gaps because the narrative is really believed in because it has hijacked our deepest spiritual drives for things like happiness. In fact, narrative is something which we don't have to consciously adopt the standpoint of using because, as Greer mentioned in a 2006 Archdrude Report post, we think with stories as reliably as we walk with feet. Insofar as you're thinking, you're really telling a story, however subtly it might be. We do this even in things that seem to be completely unnarratological, like, say, science, okay? But the truth about doing science is 
that the real reason why um, it is um, supported okay, is that there's an understanding on a narratological level that some benefit is going to come from it, okay? Some benefit the level of standard of living or we're going to be curing diseases, etc., things like that, okay? So there's an understanding that the research itself is part of a story in which on the other end of that story within time is going to be an outcome where some tangible benefit arrives. Of course, a lot of scientific research, as blasphemous as this might be, is actually dangerous and much of it actually causes problems. But we can't say that because the um, image of the whole is supplied by narrative and the gaps are filled in by imagination rather than simply um, sorting the, the sense contents as given with an experience um, into their uh, proper corresponding figurations. Okay, so if you think about memes like the apocalypse utopia or speculative bubble, um, you might argue that insofar as you have a complete time image there, it's simply a narrative which contains a beginning, a middle, and an end in which a problem is introduced which disrupts ordinary world somewhere near the beginning, and then it is resolved by a hero at the climax which allows one to return to the peaceful ordinary world. This is the essence of pretty much every narrative, okay? And the problem with the bubble apocalypse and utopia is that they might be emotionally compelling stories, but they're still impossible. You can imagine them, but you cannot experience them. As you say, it might exist on the inner world, as Greer calls it in a later Ecosophia post, um, but they can exist in the outer world. The problem is that we always live in both of these worlds, but we might be misled to think that um, uh, one of them has to abide by the laws of the other, or worse, that only one of the two must really exist, okay? And the tendency for the meme perhaps to only be able to sustain its existence on the inner world of imagination without being even possible on the outer world, I think is something we can only understand if we find that the kinds of stories which can't be, in, can't be fulfilled in the outer world are ones which are ecologically impossible. Some stories are more possible than others, not only on um, a purely temporal level of a sequence of events within narrative, which once again your imagination can pretty well destroy pretty much anything to fit into, rather on the deeper level of ecology. But what is ecology except the systematic understanding of how parts and wholes function? If you have a sober understanding of that, you'll realize that insofar as you make claims that it is possible to continue extracting finite non-renewable natural resources forever, you don't realize that you're already contradicting yourself because a finite is the opposite of infinite. <laughs> and non-renewable is the opposite of renewable, but you're basically trying to attribute both of these properties at once to the same thing. On an even more simple level, ecology alone is enough to show you that the image of the whole earth is a closed system. Insofar as you could project um, an open set of infinite resources on such a closed system, you would literally have to project a pipeline coming from outer space delivering you more oil on demand. And this is something which Greer uh, put forth as a joke many times over the years in, say, the Archford Report, but the um, theory of abiotic oil, which I still get questions on regularly, has actually turned this into a literal hypothesis for why peak oil um, should not be a problem. It's the idea that, um, well, the oil was not the result of um, hundreds of millions of years worth of geological processes of um, basically condensing all of the, the um, energy of uh, dead organisms into a form which we can easily use. Rather, uh, oil came from outer space. So there, I don't know, asteroids or something crashed into the earth and brought us as much oil as we want. And this is a comforting fantasy, but it is <laughs> perhaps the purest example of what we might call an ecologically impossible object or rather an ecologically impossible narrative, okay? And this is something which is um, perhaps better described for Greer as an ecologically impossible narrative rather than an ecologically impossible object because insofar as that gives you a perverse or distorted image of time, it contradicts what actually happens within history, okay, because Greer himself defined history in I think the third volume of the Archwood Report as ecology mapped onto the dimension of time. What happens over a span of time 
only can happen if it is first ecologically possible. As you say, if it does not violate the universal rules for how parts and wholes function. Okay. In other words, knowing the rules of ecology will allow you to know the rules of other things like history, okay, as something of a universal skeleton key for many other disciplines, which is why when asked for a reading list to understand his work um, in one of the early Archer Report posts, um, I think the first thing he mentioned was just get an ecology textbook, okay, well, there's other works I want you to read, like Spengler's um, Decline of the West um, and, and things like that, but the first thing I want you to read um, beyond, before limits to growth and things like that um, is just an ecology textbook, because that'll tell you in a sober level um, how parts and wholes function, okay? And if you try to adopt this sort of ecological thinking, okay, bef and, and um, um, use that to evaluate whether a given, hist a given proposed narrative regarding the sequence of events of time um, is credible or not, okay, before you agree to just get sucked into the narrative, okay, you have this kind of screening process for narratives um, to see whether they're ecologically possible or not. This sort of ecological thinking allows you to see, for example, the narrative of technological progress for what it really is, precisely through temporarily suspending the familiar narrative that all technologies um, that are new, by definition, function better and also, by definition, make us happier than their predecessors did. We actually don't find this confirmed within the level of sensory experience, um, but still something that we believe because it is a mandatory part of the stories we tell about technology. But if you examine that narrative um, from an ecological standpoint, what you'll really find, as John McGreer noted in his 2017 classic, The Retro Future, Looking to the Past to Remake the Future, what you really find is that insofar as we're talking here about modern technology, that is an inherently misleading term. As many modern technologies actually combine things discovered a very long time ago, like, like say the combustion engine, which was well over a century ago, we already worked out basically that technology. Um, and you might combine it with some superficial computerized layer over the top. You have, you know, a coffee maker with a, a mini computer in it um, to set a timer for make my coffee for me at 530 in the morning. You know, that's kind of how um, that's kind of uh, uh, enough to justify raising the price you know, two or three times higher um, is to uh, not make me push one button with my finger, it'll push that button for me, is kind of the logic here. Um, so we, we have actually a combination of technologies from different times, but we label all of it as new or modern because we won't acknowledge that insofar as a technology is more modern than another, we're not really talking about whether it functions better or even whether it makes the person who uses it happier. All we're really talking about is how large its externality system is. Now, externalities are something which you really can't discuss, especially in the West, because they're things which are incredibly important, but things which the narrative of progress kind of requires us to pretend are not part of the story. We kind of um, make the ecological error of pretending that they don't exist, even though they play arguably the most important part of this whole process. And what they are is simply the um, costs of production which are pushed onto a third party. So um, dumping toxins in a river, for example, relieves the factory owner of having to directly pay for having to deal with them. It also provides superficially um, cheaper products on the market for the consumer, but those costs don't disappear. They simply lead to health problems for whoever is unfortunate to get enough to get their um, drinking water either directly or indirectly from that river. As something which the process of natural selection within technologies in the plural, that's another idea of Greer. There is no modern technology in the singular. Um, there are many technologies in the plural, and insofar as you have a process of natural selection there, the only factor which determines um, the victory in that competition is how many costs can be pushed onto some third party. Um, and the only thing which you can guarantee about a newer technology is that its total externality system, in this case largely spanning the entire world, will be larger than whatever it replaced. He notes that um, this sort of ecological thinking also allows you to understand that even those who take seriously the idea that modern industrial civilization is unsustainable on ecological grounds alone often make the error of thinking that that means that insofar as there will be a collapse, it'll be sudden and total. 
He noted in his book The Long Descent that the uh, analysis of civilizational collapses in the past of mighty civilizations tended to span a couple generations. So oftentimes uh, somebody who was a, a teenager um, when it began might be a, a grandmother by the time that the process is kind of more or less done, okay? And this is for ecological reasons, okay, which deserve a much longer discussion, but I'll have to do a whole video on the long descent. Um, there's also the book The Ecotechnic Future. These are kind of like a pair of books to be read together, and this is the idea that um, insofar as we have something like a technological society right now, this is not necessarily an idea that's going to disappear entirely even after the collapse of this industrial civilization because in a certain sense the future technical societies although vastly different from the ones we might imagine them to be in say like the science fiction ray kurzweil sense are still going to be technological societies they'll just be more sustainable ones and this makes sense within the laws of ecology themselves because um, ecological succession enough tells you uh, that um, the first seer, I think the term is, is usually the most wasteful in, in a succession of stages in a vacant lot. His own example, you have these um, pioneer weeds that show up immediately, okay, um, and, um, you know, um, and colonize as much territory that's left open to them as they can, but they're not sustainable over time. Those are replaced by things like trees, and eventually you get forest, which is sustainable in a way that they're not. And you make the same argument about the succession of technological societies. The first one we're living in now is simply the, the pioneer weeds of that group, and the sustainable forests will come later, but of course, they won't be technological in the sense that most people would assume that term means. So therefore, the ecological explanation provides a fully rational explanation for why the deep memes of bubbles, apocalypses, and utopias fail, and that what those promise, all, in all cases, is ecologically impossible. Greer personally responded to my questions um, a few weeks ago by clarifying, the solution here is not to exit out of narrative or out of abstraction, for that is not even possible. Okay, uh, the solution is rather to simply learn new stories. Okay, um, stories which we can judge are better because they give more accurate predictions regarding the future. Okay, and the reason why they give more accurate predictions about the future is presumably that. Uh, they get closer to the ideal of ecological thinking, okay? And, of course, history simply is ecology mapped over the dimension of time, okay? Insofar as you have a more functional understanding of how parts and wholes function, you can tell better stories, which um, lead you to uh, get ahead of uh, certain problematic trends before they actually happen, okay? So, uh, Greer re recommended in a very early Arts Group report post from, say, 2006, uh, that um, insofar as uh, people are asking, well, what can I do to prepare um, you know, for what's coming, he said, well, look, just learn some more stories, you know, get a collection of um, stories, especially from before the rise of fossil fuel modernity, because insofar as we have this um, spurious infinity of so many different stories on, say, Netflix and, and Hollywood films, and even like, you know, go to your uh, paperback section of, of uh, novels, um, sensationalist literature in any bookstore today. It seems like we have a lot of stories, maybe more than ever before in history, but in a lot of ways they're all really telling the same one story, which is the story of progress. You have to go to the time before fossil fuel modernity to actually see a plurality of stories in which um, the um, beginning, middle, and end um, really are not the same in all of the fairy tales and Grimm's fairy tales. Sometimes taking a risk pays off, sometimes it doesn't, to use Greer's own example. Okay, And the apocalypse meme is really the meme of progress in disguise rather than something that tells a totally different story because as Greer's men mentioned himself um, it's really the idea that uh, we have progressed to the point that um, our technological society has become powerful enough even to destroy the world. We know that that's not actually true and nature is a lot more powerful than anything we think we are um, but we still have this idea even among people who are trying to suspend the narrative of progress that progress has gotten to the point now that it can destroy itself. We have to learn genuinely different stories and a great way to do that is to go to sources like fairy tales. So um, the interesting thing about the shape of time is that Greer does not 
claim to offer the ultimate one which really is in much the same way they says i'm not trying to tell you how to get out of narrative to see ultimate reality in its purified form i'm just trying to tell you i uh, ask you to find better stories well similarly with shapes of time we can grant that progress is a dysfunctional shape of time um in, a, in an era which is actually defined by decline but greer admits that um on an evolutionary level it was adaptive in the early years of the industrial revolution if you gambled on the idea that um progress rather than stagnation or decline would define the future you could make decisions that would pay off in that context unfortunately we are not living in a context like that anymore so now we need different shapes of time what's well, interesting that he has mentioned in other posts um, such as on eco sophia that um insofar as you want to understand the kind of shape which nature itself uses it's actually kind of a circle it's because insofar as we disrupt natural cycles with technology and turn them into straight lines it's always temporary after a certain amount of time nature always finds a way to turn that back into a cycle and this is um, perhaps something to do with the fact that Greer himself mentioned um, as a druid that um, there really is some th sort of divine power to be understood within the cycles of nature themselves okay and um, therefore it does make sense to say that nature itself thinks in circles or at the very least that it works in circles so um, this is something which I really enjoyed um, and I thank everybody who has been a part of it and I look forward to more discussions on Greer in the future.